Okay, well, welcome um, to session three and day two of the VCBH annual conference. My name is Andrea Valanti. I'm a faculty member in the Vermont Center on Behavior and Health. Just a few reminders about how we run the sessions. Um, you can use the chat function to introduce yourself or to foster conversation, but please use the Q&A for any questions that you wanna have um, answered during the Q&A session at the end. Um, the questions that are in the chat will not be shared with our speakers, so do make sure to add your questions to the Q&A. And also, this is a session that is being recorded and posted to our website and our YouTube channel for on-demand viewing. So this is being recorded. Today, we have an amazing lineup um, on a topic that I love to talk about, too. And this is um, a focus on what happens if we were to ban um, menthol or other flavored products um, and potentially what the impact is on um, on disadvantaged and other populations. So you can see the lineup that we have here, Kevin Schroth, Pebbles Fagan, Michael Kotler, and Mike Cummings. And I'm going to move on to introduce um, Kevin. So Kevin Schroth is an associate professor in the Department of Health Behavior and Society and Policy at Rutgers School of Public Health. He's also a core member of the Rutgers Center for Tobacco Studies. Kevin is an interesting character. He's a lawyer turned academic. He came from uh, the New York City Department of Mental Health of Health and Mental Hygiene, where he served as the senior legal counsel directing tobacco control policy for the city. During his tenure, he played a principal role in drafting and advancing more than a dozen laws designed to reduce tobacco use um, and policies designed to reduce sodium and sugary beverage consumption. And just a few of those highlights uh, include the plan to reduce tobacco retail density by more than 50%, a ban on pharmacies selling tobacco products and e-cigarettes, minimum price scheme for all tobacco products, taxes on non-cigarette products, and a ban on tobacco related trans transactions for discount of any kind, among others. Kevin currently focuses his research on how tobacco regulatory science can support laws that decrease tobacco consumption and how the tobacco control model can be applied in different areas like sugary beverages and cannabis. Kevin, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you for being with us this morning. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I'm going to share my screen and get started. Um, if you haven't noticed, I have a little baby Yoda on my coffee mug, not only because it's early, but for a reason that you will, that will become evident soon. Okay. Um, can everybody see my slides? Can anybody no, who's... We see um, files. Okay, so now you must see my slides. We do. All right. I'm trying to switch something so that you see my slides and not my file. Okay, how's that? That works. Okay. We'll get started now. Sorry about the delay. All right. As Andrea noted, I am Kevin Schroth, and I'm going to get started here. All right. Cue the John Williams music. Um, not long. Dun, da, 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 da. Not long ago, not far away, tobacco products were completely unregulated. After the master settlement agreement. Uh, tobacco industry expanded its influence to, at the point of sale, selling menthol cigarettes and flavored cigars. A ragtag group of advocates and localities fought the ban, fought to ban flavored tobacco products. Meanwhile, federal authorities worked on plans that might provide a new hope. Things were not easy at first, though. The Tobacco Control Act passed in 2009. Um, 
called for attention to menthol cigarettes, but for quite some time, concrete steps were not taken to follow up on that. There was a TIPSAC report, an FDA report. Several times the FDA called for advanced notice of uh, proposed rulemaking and asked for comments related to the regulation of menthol cigarettes. The FDA even had a proposed regulation that would have uh, curtailed the sale of uh, menthol cigarettes in the future going forward. This was back in 2015, but it did not materialize. And even back in 2018, the, the commissioner of the FDA said that it was a mistake to back away on menthol. Nevertheless, the FDA announced plans to ban menthol cigarettes, flavored cigars, and, uh, and at least some flavored e-cigarettes in 2018. All of these announcements were met with uh, vir virtually no follow-up concrete in, in terms of concrete steps. Um, in 2020, a lawsuit asked the FDA to take more concrete steps uh, by specifically asking the FDA to respond to a citizen's petition that had been filed in 2013. Um, ultimately, the FDA responded to that pressure and said that it would respond to the citizen petition in a substantive way rather than just in a form letter. And on April 29th, 2021, the FDA granted the petition state, stating that it would begin rulemaking within one year. And here's a copy of that letter uh, to Doug Blanke, who was one of the uh, signatories of that citizen petition and a party to the lawsuit. So what does that mean? That means the FDA can and has promised to come forward with one, possibly two product standards that would prohibit the sale of certain types of products. Here are menthol cigarettes and, and flavored cigars. Uh, it's unclear exactly how they will uh, frame that, how they, how they will define the products that would be covered by, uh, by such a rule, if and when it happens. Um, but if you look at the Tobacco Control Act, you find the source of the authority in question. It authorizes the FDA to issue a product standard. And in doing so, it specifically says that the FDA must do certain things. It has to consider risks and benefits to the population, the, the likelihood that uh, the, the standard will cause people that currently use the product in question to stop, and that it might prevent people from getting started with that particular product. It has to be technically achievable. And the FDA has to consider any countervailing effects. For example, creating a significant demand for contraband. I'm going to focus on that countervailing effects that, as you may recall, the title of my presentation was potentially anticipated and unanticipated consequences of a rule like this. Other presenters are going to talk about uh, the effect that a rule like this could have on smoking rates and issues like that. I'm going to talk about some of these other potential uh, consequences that are part of the rulemaking process and have to be addressed for the rule to, to be uh, successful. So uh, when you're looking for a source of authority on potential bad things that could happen in the wake of uh, an FDA rulemaking, there's no better source than R.J. Reynolds. So back in 2018, they submitted uh, documents, as did Altria, opposing the FDA's uh, advanced notice of proposed rulemaking, which asked for comments on this idea of banning flavors in cigarettes or cigars. They submitted a lengthy document that outlined a number of potential countervailing effects, uh, gen and, and I'm going to walk through them. They include illicit trade, sales to youth, uh, make your own menthol cigarettes, criminalization, and loss of tax revenue. So first, uh, the concept of illicit trade. And this, this is a, an argument that the tobacco industry turns to all the time, anytime, virtually any time that a proposed regulation 
is out there in the world, the tobacco industry will say, this is going to lead to illicit trade. Well, let's look at that. Um, first, Can Canada banned menthol cigarettes, and they have not seen a surge in their illicit market for menthol cigarettes. Uh, in many ways, uh, or at least in many places, illicit trade might decrease uh, particularly if you look at the patterns of illicit trade in related to cigarettes right now, there's strong tendencies for, uh, or there's strong trade where uh, cigarettes are purchased in low tax states. Uh, sometimes uh, a common course is uh, purchases to take place in Virginia, where the tax is about 35 cents per pack. And to be uh, trafficked up to places like New York City that have very high taxes. And New York City is not the only place with high taxes and Virginia is not the only place with low taxes, but that's one example of. So if menthol is banned, those cigarettes can't be sold legally in Virginia in the first place. So the entire market changes and the existing illicit trade market, at least for menthol cigarettes, dries up. Um, New York City is a mecca for illicit trafficking. More than 50% of the New York City market is estimated to be um, untaxed. Um, and menthol is very popular in New York City. 48% of the New York City smokers smoke menthol in certain neighborhoods like Bronx and, and Harlem. Um, about 80% of littered packs are actually untaxed um, Newport cigarettes, often hailing from Virginia. Um, so what's going to happen to this existing tax driven illicit market that uh, goes interstate? Well, at least for menthol cigarettes, which are a significant portion of the market, um, they're likely to shift overseas. Um, but if there's currently 4.5 billion legal menthol packs being sold in the United States annually, that volume just, it's, it's difficult to conceive of that volume being replaced in any significant way through illicit overseas markets. Um, so we are likely to see a smaller scale illicit market um, and prices, it's difficult to uh, anticipate how the prices will uh, respond in, in that scenario. One thing I just wanna point out here, if you have um, a rule like this, it's really important to put funding towards enforcement. Back in 2013, um, Congress passed the PACT Act, charging the US Postal Service with, with enforcing it and not shipping cigarettes. And I, I'm going to highlight briefly a lawsuit that New York City, where I used to work, filed recently with, uh, along with the states of California and Illinois against the US Postal Service. Um, and it's based on the idea that US Postal is receiving cigarettes from abroad and delivering them to people in the United States without putting enough attention to the products it's receiving to determine that they are in fact illicit and they're just shipping them. So US Postal actually has a non-compliant list of shippers who are suspected to be involved in illicit trade of uh, untaxed cigarettes and as the complaint alleges, and the complaint recently survived a motion to dismiss, uh, meaning that there was sufficient um, evidence or, or credibility to the allegations that it can, it can move forward. Um, U.S. Postal, there's internal documents showing that U U.S. Postal did not assign anybody to do any enforcement related to its non-compliant list. So they, sure, they, they have this list identifying people that shouldn't be shipping, but they didn't do anything about it. Similarly, they have a return to sender uh, program uh, under which when they do get cigarettes or they've, they have packages that they have identified as containing cigarettes that should not be shipped, instead of seizing the cigarettes or destroying the cigarettes, they return them to the sender, the sender abroad. And part of the investigation revealed that most of the time that happens, the sender gets the cigarettes and ships them again and may, maybe corrects 
or, or improves their uh, strategy for shipping them successfully into the United States, and usually it works. So, and the, a lot of this was based on an invest, investigator general report that was done in 2017. So there's a high level of credibility uh, underlying these allegations. And, and but in short, it's critical to have funds for places like US Postal to actually follow through on laws that restrict the availability of some of these products. Um, another countervailing, potential countervailing effect, and this is something that we've seen in Canada and a little bit in Europe, um, is the idea of make your own menthol cigarettes. There's products that have uh, sprung up where people can flavor their own cigarettes. Um, Another issue is the idea that when when a sa- when a market is unregulated, sales can are can easily go to underage buyers. So, a few responses to that. First, it depends on the size of the illicit market and the access that's likely to happen. Just because uh, sellers are not going to be checking the ID of purchasers, it doesn't mean that the product will be widely available. It may be available in some places, it might not be available in others. And I think more importantly, this concept uh, that youth are suddenly going to have access to menthol cigarettes, uh, I think m- it misses or, or does not place much emphasis on trends in tobacco use among youth where combustible cigarette use has declined significantly and e-cigarette use has uh, been become more of a replacement product. Uh, And and again, here's some points on the uh, make your own menthols. Um, Even if this happens, again, the scale is likely to be small and the quality of the product uh, is not likely to be as consistent as uh, what comes from the tobacco industry, which refined its trade over decades to make their product as um, attractive and and consistently uh, and consistent as possible. Uh, Another argument that uh, Reynolds has uh, been pushing out for years now, and and has been pushing it out sometimes through spokespeople like Reverend Al Sharpton and his uh, company, National uh, African Network, I think, um, NAN, and they've they've been fund, uh, Reynolds has been funding them to go out and and make the argument that uh, if menthol is illegal, that will lead to more conflict between um, black youth and law enforcement. And one of the things that this uh, argument really misses is that this a product standard would prevent the manufacturer of the product. Um, It would be enforced on a retail level, a commercial level. Not, it, it would not be, it seems unlikely that this could lead to the types of conflict Uh, that are described. And in fact, there's little or no evidence that this could even happen or has ever happened in the jurisdictions that have restrictions on menthol cigarettes. Finally, loss of tax revenue. If you look at Altria's own estimate on tax revenue generated by tobacco products, it's about $63 billion annually. It sounds like a lot. It includes excise taxes, MSA payments, sales taxes, even income tax for employees of tobacco companies. First of all, only a fraction of that would deal with menthol uh, cigarettes. Second of all, if you look at the cost of smoking related illness, it's roughly five times greater. And here's a a slide from Truth that estimates it at over $300 billion. And that includes direct medical care costs plus lost productivity. So there's no comparison really. Um, And that's exactly what the product standard uh, calls for. It calls for comparisons. You're supposed to balance the benefits against the risks. Um, I have a slide here called an optimist's timeline. Um, If the FDA comes out with its product standard uh, before April of 2022, it's still a long way away before we get there. And and this uh, slide is from an article that I actually authored with uh, Andrea. And it lists, and what I called an optimist's timeline because it lists some of the shortest periods of time that are necessary for a product standard to go into effect. Some of them could be longer. 
possible that they could be shorter, but unlikely. So for example, there are 60 days for public comment, that goes pretty quickly, but then the FDA has to review comments. Even though they've already received comments on menthol twice in the last 10 years, it's hard to imagine that they could do that, that they would review the comments in less than 10 months or a year. It could be quite a bit longer. Um, lawsuits are possible. Plus, once the rule is finalized, the FDA has to wait 12 months um, before the rule can go into effect. And, uh, and the litigation delays could easily be up to two years. Um, and that could include trial trials and appeals. And it could be significantly longer than two years. I'm gonna say a few words about flavored cigars as well. Um, the FDA has signaled that it plans to address flavored cigars. Um, first off, um, flavored cigars are an increasing share of the cigar market. And that increase really coincided with the, the Tobacco Control Act going into effect, prohibiting the sale of flavored cigarettes. Um, we saw them go up from 45% of the cigar market to where they are now, um, which is well over 50%. Um, convenience store sales are driven largely by flavored cigars and the increase in sales of flavored cigars. From 2009 to 2020, uh, sales, convenience store sales increased 32% for cigars overall, 56% for flavored cigars. 79% of attributable growth in convenience store sales is from flavored cigars. And to quote one of my uh, colleagues at Rutgers, flavors keep the machine made cigar industry humming. That's Christine Del Nevo. A number of cities have passed restrictions on flavored cigars. I'm not going to get into them now. But uh, over time, they've become stronger and they've include, included menthol and had fewer exceptions for certain types of establishments. Massachusetts and California, the first two states with really comprehensive flavor bans on a state level. Uh, California's is not in effect yet, but it, uh, it may go into effect uh, in November 2022 after it uh, hopefully survives a, uh, a public uh, challenge. Um, but some of these flavored laws have dealt with uh, enforcement challenges, and it's important to take note of them and just consider how the FDA is likely to do this. Local jurisdictions have struggled with this a little bit. If it happens on a federal level and the federal level just cuts off manufacturing, that might obviate these challenges that localities have dealt with but one is just with the names of the products. Uh, in New York City, we passed the first uh, strong flavored restrictive law, and it was based on the names of the products. And we saw that uh, the industry sidestepped this to a degree by just changing the names of some of their products and, and starting to shift towards concept, what we call concept flavors. And here's a good example of that. Instead of calling a cigar grape, they called it Purple Thunder. Uh, so they take the name of a flavor out and replace it with something that uh, still works. Um, and there's a lot of different examples of that. A number of jurisdictions, including a lot of towns in Massachusetts and Chicago, came up with lists of prohibited flavors. So aside from like the obvious ones like grape and strawberry, uh, they came up with these lengthy lists that uh, captured every flavored tobacco product as well as they could. But these are really laborious lists to create and they're difficult and burdensome to, and to expect uh, inspectors to be familiar with lists that are 30 pages long. Um, here's a, an example of just one page of a list that was created by the Massachusetts Association uh, Health Board that was a guidance that a lot of towns would use. And the list was 34 pages long 12 pages just for cigar flavors, 15 pages for e-cigarette flavors. So not a great long-term solution. Uh, Massachusetts now came out with a law that requires retailers to get a letter from manufacturers saying that the product is not flavored before they can put it on their shelves. And here's an example. Um, 
So the letter has to list products that are being sold. It has to certify that they're not flavored. And that's a significant burden. It's a burden on the retailer and it's also a burden on the manufacturer. So I'm really curious to see how that plays out. Um, and the final thing I'm going to talk about is the, uh, the FDA's uh, pre-market tobacco authorization process. So products are currently uh, required and any product that entered the market after uh, February 15th, 2017 is required to get the FDA to authorize it to be sold legally on the market. And to do that, they have to make one or two assertions. They have to be able to say that the new cigar, a post-2007 cigar, is substantially equivalent to a predicate cigar, which is a cigar before that cutoff date, or they have to say, if it's not substantially equivalent, does it raise different questions of public health? And if you look at some of the orders and they've started to come out now where the FDA has evaluated these applications, we see that orders uh, suggest that flavors are not a factor in the FDA's analysis. They're looking at toxicity uh, and, and almost toxicity alone. They also look at the size of the product because the size of the product means that it could have more toxicants just because it's bigger. Um, but they're not looking at the presence of flavors specifically as a, as, as a uh, variable that could lead to greater sales because it's more attractive, because it's uh, more popular among youth. Um, a few other things I noticed in looking at some of these uh, substantial equivalent orders, uh, you have predicates or you, ha you have applicants like black and mild jazz that are naming predicates like black and mild wine. Now black and mild wine is clearly a wine flavored cigar. Black and mild jazz, the name doesn't clearly indicate, this is like one of those concept flavors. The name doesn't state the flavor. Um, and their, their paperwork says that ja uh, jazz has no flavor. They say none in response to the question of flavor. The FDA's paper, the FDA's substantial equivalent order has a footnote that basically says, we know they said it's not flavored. We're not taking a position on that. So, and, and in, if you look at these orders, the, the jazz one was decided in 2019. And here's a footnote that basically says the FDA is not taking a position. And in more recent uh, SE orders, the FDA has redacted what is presumably similar language. Um, I just thought that was interesting. So one thing that troubles me a little bit is whether the SE authorization uh, Fact, could factor into litigation regarding a cigar product standards. So who, who decides if a cigar is flavored and how is it decided? Um, the FDA authorized jazz um, without saying it was flavored. Now for many years, I, I actually, I shouldn't say many, I think it was four years, there was a hard fought litigation in Yarmouth, Yarmouth Massachusetts uh, under, fought, fought principally by Cumberland Farms, but also by, or at least nominally by Cumberland Farms, but also Black and Mild. Um, and they argued that jazz was not flavored. And anybody who's ever smelled a, a jazz cigar would probably agree that it smells like it's quite flavored and kind of fruity. Um, and Black and Mild has uh, maintained this uh, position really rigorously or strictly that it's not flavored, but they lost the lawsuit. Everybody who smelled the cigar and was involved in the process said that it was flavored. But I just wonder if uh, there could be challenges to assessments of whether products are flavored, even after a product standard. Um, and, and, and even looking at FDA authorization orders might even factor into some of those uh, conversations. So that's all that I have for now. So, but my, the, uh, but we'll have questions afterwards, but I just, uh, even, even though product standards are out, are potentially coming and they could be great, there are some risks and there's certain things that could be done and should be done to make sure that they're done as effectively as possible.
Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. That was a great presentation and uh, gives us a lot to think about in terms of how these, how the industry will come at these, um, these potential rules. Um, I just want to remind everyone to put their questions in the Q&A box um, and we will get to them at the end of the session. Um, so thank you again, Kevin. We are moving to our next presenter, um, Pebbles Fagan, who is another great collaborator. Um, she's professor in the Department of Health Behavior and Health Education and also director of the Center for the Study of Tobacco at the Faye Boozman College of Public Health at the University of Arkansas Medical Sciences. She's also the director of research in the Office of Health Initiatives and Disparities Research in the Department of Surgery in the College of Medicine and serves as a senior advisor to CDC in the director of the Office of Smoking and Health. Uh, as, I, as I was thinking about this whole panel, I thought for our trainees, what an, an incredible group of people to show that work in this area can really move between sectors. So as I mentioned earlier, Kevin came from uh, being general counsel in a city health department. Pebble spent 10 years as a health scientist in the tobacco control research branch at NCI before moving into the academic world again. Um, uh, she's a behavioral scientist and over, has over 25 years of experience in conducting research that aims to increase our knowledge on how to reduce tobacco and cancer related health disparities in racial, ethnic, social, socially disadvantaged and marginalized communities. She's used team based science to examine social, behavioral and biobehavioral factors associated with health, health disparities and has been engaged in tobacco regulatory science since its inception. It's my great pleasure to introduce Pebbles, and we look forward to your pre presentation on reducing smoking in disadvantaged and racial ethnic minority populations. Yeah, thank you so much for that very kind introduction and allowing me to be part of this uh, panel. I'm going to uh, share my screen here. Uh, let me let's do this. Okay, that should do it. Okay. All right, let me put this on. Okay, I know everybody's probably zoomed out over the last couple of years here, but this is the best way in which we can do our team oriented work and to help you to understand um, continuously what some of the most pressing issues out there related to tobacco control. So I'm going to talk about um, how we reduce smoking and disadvantaged racialized minoritized populations uh, with a uh, menthol as an undercurrent uh, to uh, this particular talk. Uh, so the first thing I wanna do is to describe what social justice is and its role in reducing tobacco related health disparities where menthol plays a huge component of this. Talk about how racisms and other isms impact healthcare and then just show you some preliminary results from a study that we're currently doing a randomized trial that includes primarily um, menthol smokers who are women, African-American and are from low resource communities. So I have no disclosures. Um, now it's important for us to begin to recognize that social justice is an approach that is needed to eliminate tobacco related health disparities. For so long, we have uh, gone on this journey trying to understand the most uh, effective strategies to prevent and control tobacco use among uh, racial ethnic groups, low SES groups, and the intersection of those groups and many others. Um, but we've not yet employed this approach to a full extent um, because we have found that even though we have evidence-based practices, 
um, these populations lag behind with regard to quitting and the reduction of consequences that include things such as low lung cancer. Now, I can give an entire talk on social justice and menthol and social justice and interventions, but I want to just do a brief overview to provide the context of why this is important. And so social justice is really about improving the lives and the well-being of a historically um, minoritized, racialized, oppressed, and marginalized groups that face racism and discrimination because of their phenotype, um, because of their ethnicity, um, age, sex, religion, um, sexual identity, gender identity, nationality, and even geography. Um, I work in rural areas, um, and I know Vermont is a largely rural state, and um, we do have geographic disparities um, related to island communities and rural and urban communities as well. And, you know, there are many essential dimensions of social justice. It depends on who you ask. I use the model of uh, Fadden and, and Powers, who've written two really strong books about what social justice is, what social injustice is. And they really talk about how um, there are uh, six general principles of well being that encompass social justice, which include health, knowledge, and understanding, personal security, equal respect, personal attachment, and social um, self determination. Um, social justice approaches identify these interlocking patterns of disadvantage that systematically, systematically marginalize uh, population groups. And so I won't go through the, the details of all of the components of these six essential components of social justice. But I think what's important to understand here is that these all link back to institutional values and how institutions facilitate health to um, population groups, including the Food and Drug Administration and the National Institutes of Health who have the authority and the power to ban menthol cigarettes to and other flavored products to protect the health of vulnerable population groups. That is the physical health and the mental health of these populations. Even knowledge and understanding links back to our institutions because our institutions help to facilitate people's knowledge and understanding of the world, what is going on with these populations to then facilitate decision-making around how to protect the health of these populations. Um, and when we think about personal security, and that is the absence or fear of, of physical and psychological abuse, I think back to racism and discrimination because those factors occur in communities they occur at the institutional levels and those things influence one's ability to access and to be provided help. Uh, so, um, but you can certainly read uh, Powers and uh, Fadden, um, their social injustice book that was recently put out in 2019, have a lot of details and discussion on these factors. The other thing I wanna mention is that you know, there are various levels and domains of influence on tobacco related health disparities. You know, what you heard Kevin talk about was the issue of these policies and how decision making happens in the context of a Family Smoking Prevention and Tobacco Control Act that then impacts the individual level of health and behaviors that. Um, occur at that particular level. So there are things that we can do at both the societal, community, and interpersonal individual levels that all influence what happens with the Food and Drug Administration with regard to uh, policies related to protecting the health of different population groups. And so um, I think most people may be aware that the National Institutes of Health has acknowledged that structural racism is an underlying current of health. Um, they have the UNITE initiative that uh, was launched in uh, January, I believe January of 2021, 
to begin to address these issues. We know that Francis Collins has issued an apology uh, related to the fact that uh, many populations have um, uh, been the, have been victimized because of what our federal government has done with regard to how it approaches science, how it approaches policies, how it approaches diversity and inclusion. And you can go to their website and get that information, but this is a big deal because as long as I have been alive, I've never known the federal government, particularly the National Institutes of Health to issue a formal apology and acknowledgement, which is the first step that structural racism and discrimination influence how we do our science, which then affects the health of different population groups. And so, um, as I mentioned, acknowledgement is the first step, okay? That then leads to understanding of why social justice approach is needed, necessary, and unavoidable for institutions to move towards if we are to eliminate disparities. Um, and then change can begin, okay? Within institutions and social structures that impact those six elements of uh, social um, justice. And so let me share with you just an example of a study that we are doing right now um, that is the family rising to enforce smoke-free homes. It's called Project Fresh. It's funded by the National Institutes of Minority Health and Health Disparities. And the reason why I use the study as an example is because the majority of the people in this study are smoking uh, menthol-laden cigarettes. And so um, we approach this study with several underlying assumptions which is that policies are an important strategy to protect the spirit populations from tobacco smoke exposure and smoking. We do not yet have a ban on menthol, which is the most commonly used uh, tobacco product among African-Americans, women, LGBTQ, and many other population groups. There is a need to continue to push other policies in the absence of this ban that may be helpful um, and when you live in a tobacco nation state like I do, where preemption is, you know, here and you can't do anything about restricting flavors and menthol, uh, um, what happens at the federal level becomes critically important. And then what we can do in terms of interventions um, at the community level becomes important as well. Um, in fact, the only thing that we can do anything about here is our clean indoor air policies, which are not um, subject to the other parts of our presumption. So I'll move along fairly quickly in describing what our study has done. Um, it's an ongoing randomized intervention trial with the primary outcome of reducing secondhand smoke exposure in the home. Um, and we know that menthol is a huge, smoking is a huge contributor to that because that's what people are smoking um, in the counties in which we're working. And quitting is a secondary outcome. And so we be began recruiting African-American women caregivers in 2019 to the FRESH study in Lee and Phillips County, which are some of the most disparate counties in the nation. These counties have um, some of the... Um, lowest life expectancy, highest poverty rates, and there's a history of systematic racism in these counties on top of uh, having poor tobacco policies and health infrastructure in our state. We recruited women who smoked either cigarettes or little cigars and cigar reels for at least a year who could um, enroll in our study. And in these counties, uh, cigarette smoking still exceeds 25%, uh, which is almost uh, double what the national rate is uh, for population groups. So we have a huge, huge problem here. We did our formative research in two other counties with very high smoking rates, Chico and Deshaies counties, which are also located in the Delta region of our state, right along the Mississippi River. Um, uh, from these counties, um, we learned a lot about um, 
people's perceptions around secondhand smoke exposure, quitting, and we use that information to help develop well, both intervention counties. Um, our intervention. Uh, move on. Uh, somehow that was a pre recording. But now we're working in Leah Phillips County. And I want to point out um, what the history, because this historic racism discrimination influence the levels of, of oppression that you see in these counties as to why progress hasn't been made. Many of you have probably heard about the Tulsa massacres, Rosewood, which happened in Florida, and many other, but the Elaine massacre, and I can't get into the details because of time this morning, um, uh, actually resulted in um, anywhere between 200 and 1,500 African Americans being slaughtered because farmers were meeting to organize and talk about um, inequities and wages. And um, there were whites in the counties who did not like that. And gunshots were fired in the church where African-Americans were meeting. They fired back. A white male was killed, which began the Elaine massacre. What happened is that after that, Blacks went into hiding because they were fearful of what was gonna happen next. The governor, of the state of Arkansas sent federal troops in to actually kill and murder African-Americans. When they saw the troops coming in, they thought the troops were coming to protect them. So they came out of hiding and many were murdered. They were rounded up. Whites came from neighboring states and were deputized from Louisiana, from uh, uh, Tennessee, and from Mississippi to come to Elaine and the areas in which I work now to slaughter African-Americans. So this happened, they celebrated the 100 uh, year anniversary of it in, um, um, in uh, just a few years ago. And there, this wall here is a memorial that was erected um, in honor of the Elaine massacre. But when you understand that history, you understand why the disparities, the oppression, and the slow movement of behavior change and other things occur in these areas because this still is very alive and well, and there's still a lack of admittance on the atrocities that happened over 100 years ago in this county. I have actually met some of the descendants of the Elaine massacre. So moving on, and I'm very cognizant of the time because I wanna make sure we get back on our time schedule for this morning. Um, just briefly, of course, everyone who's doing a community-based intervention had to modify their strategies during COVID-19. We were supposed to collect saliva samples at different intervals for our study. We're not able to, and in fact, we're not able to collect carbon monoxide at all the intervals either. And so we had to do some modifications, but any the, the, essentially people get allocated to one of two groups. Um, the treatment group gets educational materials, motivational interviewing through our two community health workers who work in Leah Phillips County, which are about two and a half hours from uh, Pulaski County where I live in Little Rock. And they also get feedback on um, their carbon monoxide level. So that's the biofeedback component of the intervention. Um, the control groups get the educational materials as well. Everybody's getting um, one month, three, six, and 12 month surveys. So that's just a brief um, overview of the intervention. Now our recruitment strategies have had to change over time because of COVID-19. Uh, we had a lot of in-person events such as paint with a twist where you see my uh, community health workers and one of the participants in there. Uh, we did um, a lot of referrals. A uh, word of mouth is a big, big uh, ish, uh, big um, um, uh, uh, way of people communicating information in rural counties and, and in the African-American communities. And we also lose, use social media. Social media produced nearly nothing in, in terms of recruitment and, um, you know, people said, oh yeah, use social media, but we have yet to reach uh, participants through social media, but we keep that present. So, because people are on there, they're on social media 
and they're sharing our page, but we're not recruiting participants through that. We started a volunteer board because this is really a huge component of community-based participatory research. And um, what's interesting is to help us with recruitment, but uh, really uh, we didn't get a lot of uh, participants through our community advisory board. We got most of our referrals through the participants themselves. And so what you see here in this particular chart is that over time, this is February to May of 2021, the dotted line here are the uh, referrals that we um, received over time. And so, um, and the bottom dark line is the number of recruitment events. And so you see some particular spikes and referrals over time, but we're getting a lot of people through our referral system. We're actually wrapping up our, our recruitment right now. Um, and uh, we're at 186, we're trying to get to the 206, uh, um, but we're close to it. Um, but most of that is coming through our referrals. So we actually stopped all of our in-person recruitment events. Um, briefly, this is our motivational counseling um, kind of a flow chart. Um, our community health workers uh, are engaged in asking about whether or not they're keeping their home smoke free. They encourage them to keep their home smoke free. And then they also focus on the secondary outcome, which is whether or not they're actually um, interested in quitting. And if they are, there of course is a protocol that they go through to help people quit. Um, our six month we have educational materials that we give to the women at one, three, and six months. At the one and three month mark, those educational materials were focused on keeping the home smoke free. At the six month mark, uh, we have a photo novella that one of my students developed as part of her integrated, integrated learning experience, um, uh, which is required for the MPH program. And the six month inter, uh, educational material focused on quitting. And so we have a photo novella that we developed that community members help to provide information uh, to uh, inform that. And we have integrated menthol in here. And so you have two characters, um, uh, you know, uh, one who is still a smoker, the other one who stopped smoking. And she's asking Jackie, hey, hey, Erica, do you have a cigarette? My nerves are bad. No, I stopped smoking Newports over nine months ago. Uh, Jackie, it was the best decision I ever made. The other character says, I tried to stop smoking. It's just so hard. I don't know how you did it. And then she says that she's on smokefreewomen.gov. It's a community of women who share their stories about quitting. And, you know, the other character says, well, is that all it took? And she basically says, you know, um, you know, no, you know, it took me quite a bit to quit smoking and um, that she spoke to a counselor to help her understand her addiction to menthol cigarettes. So um, we did tailor this towards menthol. And uh, this is like a 15 page photo novella that we developed that includes characters and scenes that our community members wanted to see. And so I'm just going to present to you some of the other data that we, um, and, and this is just going to take a short time, of, of some of our preliminary data. Our population is very, very, very low income. Uh, so uh, in terms of 20, almost 27% have less than a high school education. 65% have incomes less than $10,000 per year and 81% receive SNAP benefits. Just briefly, um, quit attempts are fairly low at 55% um, among um, those who um, either um, have their cigarette within five minutes awakening or not. Um, uh, those who are more addicted were less likely to have one or more quit attempts. And, um, you know, things such as cutting back or, or, or not really the strategies that these women are engaged in in terms of their quitting behaviors. Um, we also found that um, with increasing social economic disadvantage, that um, the more likely they are to uh, be addicted and have their cigarette within the first uh, five minutes of waking. So that is that 
if you're low educated alone, but you are low educated, low income, and you receive SNAP benefits that um, um, your time to first cigarette within the first five minutes of waking actually increases uh, um, among these particular groups. And so our next steps is that we've got to finish our recruitment and analyze some of the data related to secondhand smoke exposure. Um, we're going to uh, complete our final surveys, follow up on the other surveys. We have a lot of work to do in these counties with regard to tracking participants. And so when you think about interventions for very low resource populations, they do not have continuous phone service. Every month, our staff have to track down phone numbers, knock on doors to see where people still live. Do they still live there? And so our next intervention is going to remedy some of that because our staff has to spend a lot of time tracking people down and calling other people to try to find out where these participants are. Um, we have been doing food distributions in these counties as well to increase our visibility and have connected those events to our recruitment, to COVID vaccinations and to colorectal cancer screening. So because these are very low populations, we're trying to attend to the total need of the populations. And we had to do that because COVID really sent these populations into further disadvantage. Food insecurity is among the highest in the nation in um, uh, Arkansas. And um, it, it had to be addressed in order for us to reach our population groups. Uh, we are starting a new study that is gonna look at social intervention of food distribution and how that impacts quitting. And so in summary, and bringing this back to what this has to do with menthol um, is that the majority of the people who we're trying to reach smoke menthol. Um, and we have to help people continuously reduce their exposure to secondhand smoke and engage in strategies for quitting because we don't yet have policies in our state or at the federal level that is going to protect these populations from the harms of menthol cigarettes. These interlocking patterns of disadvantage that systematically marginalize these groups are what maintain smoking. The other thing that maintains smoking when we talk about systematic disadvantage is the absence of a policy that bans menthol when we know what menthol does. It is a social injustice that FDA has not taken action to ban menthol and was prompted to take action only, only because a lawsuit was launched. That is a social injustice. So I'm looking forward to seeing what's coming out of the policies because these layers of disadvantage are very difficult for us to tackle in any single intervention for the, um, what we get out of a um, R01 study from NIH. And so I will stop there and I appreciate um, the opportunity to talk to you about social justice, systematic racism, and what that has to do with our disadvantaged populations and how menthol, a ban on menthol would be a tremendous and enormous in game step to protecting these vulnerable population groups. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you for that fabulous talk. And I just wanna highlight how um, the great imagery in all of your recruitment materials and how positive it is and the, the way that you framed the study, um, I think is also something else that we really can learn from in our field of how to engage the community in this type of work. So thank you so much for that fabulous presentation. We are moving on to the next um, presentation uh, that will be done by Michael Kotler. Um, let me pull up my information, sorry about that.
Michael is an associate professor in the Department of Experimental and Clinical Pharmacology at the University of Minnesota College of Pharmacy. His research focuses on evaluating various aspects of tobacco dependence, including assessing medications to assist in the smoking cessation attempt and assessing the role of stress on smoking behavior. Currently, Michael leads grants addressing some really interesting topics, including the feasibility of, wear of using wearable technology to predict smoking lapses and examining cigarette smoking as a risk factor for greater psychiatric symptom severity. Though much of his research program has focused on the potential impacts of a ban on menthol cigarettes and menthol flavored e-cigarettes, which we're excited to hear about today. So I'll turn it over to you. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Okay, is my screen being shared just to confirm? Yes, thank you. Excellent. Well, thank you for that introduction. And thank you to the organizers of this conference for inviting me to speak this, this morning. It really is great to be here among this excellent group of panelists. So today I will speak about the potential effects of a menthol ban on smoking behavior um, among current menthol cigarette smokers. Oops, here we sorry, about, sorry about that. So um, I don't have any conflicts of interest to disclose. Um, I do, I have, have had a grant funding through Clearway, Minnesota, and um, some of the work that I'll present today has been funded by them, and I do currently have grant support from the National Institutes of Health. So I'm going to keep the background brief since I think this is something that the audience is very familiar with and the previous speakers have touched on this as well. Um, but briefly, following the passage of the Family Smoking Prevention and Tobacco Control Act, the FDA banned fruit or candy flavored cigarettes, but menthol was specifically excluded from this ban. So the FDA retained the authority to ban menthol if it was um, uh, it was found to be in the interest of public health and um, the Tobacco Product Scientific Advisory Committee um, was charged with writing a report on the effects of menthol. The TIPSAC in their report recommended that removal of menthol cigarettes from the marketplace would benefit public health in the United States. There were a number of reasons provided why that's the case. Some of them had to do with um, smoking uptake and smoking among youth, obviously extremely important topics. But as relevant to my talk today, um, one of the reasons by which removal of menthol from the marketplace would be um, beneficial is that smoking cessation is more difficult for those smoking menthol versus non-menthol cigarettes. And that seems to be particularly the case among African-Americans. The FDA produced a report subsequently evaluating the public health effects of menthol in cigarettes, which reached similar conclusions. And there's since been a number of systematic reviews and the meta-analysis that again reached similar conclusions, finding that it seems to be more difficult for smokers of menthol cigarettes to quit than of non-menthol cigarettes. And that seems to be more so the case among African-Americans. As we heard about um, earlier today, the FDA has recently taken the initial steps necessary to enact a national ban on menthol characterizing flavor in combustible cigarettes and cigars in the United States. And what I'm gonna focus on over the next 20 minutes or so is what are current menthol smokers likely to do if such a ban is enacted? Well, there's a number of different ways by which such data can be gathered. So one, um, one way by which such data has been gathered is surveys of smokers, menthol smokers specifically, asking what would they do? Um, what are their intentions if in fact menthol is banned um, from cigarettes? There's been a number of surveys. A lot of these were um, reviewed in a paper last year by Cadam and colleagues. And as you can see, a very sizable proportion of um, menthol smokers indicate that if menthol cigarettes are banned, they would quit smoking entirely. There's a substantial range among the surveys going anywhere from about a quarter to about two thirds of menthol smokers report that they would quit smoking. Obviously, if that were to happen, that would be an immense public health benefit. 
Um, there are other intentions that smokers in these surveys endorse is that some say they would switch to non-menthol cigarettes. Some say they would continue to get menthol cigarettes somehow. Some just aren't sure what they would do, whereas others I'll say that they might go to switch to other tobacco products, either combustible or non-combustible products. So um, a very sizable proportion of menthol smokers say they would quit, but sometimes what people predict they would do um, were a hypothetical situation to occur may not reflect what they would actually do. So we did a small pilot study some time ago assessing the response to a hypothetical ban on menthol cigarettes. So in this study, we recruited African-American smokers of menthol cigarettes, and we asked them to abstain from menthol cigarettes for a four week period. There were no specific instructions given regarding how to cope with the inability to smoke menthol cigarettes. So the idea was that this would simulate a ban. We anticipated that some would quit, others might switch to other products. And um, there are a number of visits that occurred over this four week period. Um, and at each visit, we measured a number of subjective measures, looked at exhaled carbon monoxide, and participants did fill out a daily tobacco diary so that we can see um, what products are they using and how much are they smoking. At the final visit, participants were asked their level of support for a menthol ban to see if um, the a simulated menthol ban would result in low support for one. So there were 32 participants who completed the study, roughly equivalent number of men and women. The average age of participants was in their mid forties. So of the 32 participants, three smokers attempted to quit. One smoker quit for four weeks, two others decreased um, the number of cigarettes they smoked substantially. So approximately 10% of participants did attempt to quit during this month. Not quite the 25 to 65% seen in surveys, but nonetheless, not an, um, not an insignificant number. If 10% of smokers were to quit after the enactment of a menthol ban, that would certainly be of importance. So those who didn't quit um, switched to non-menthol cigarettes. And the number of cigarettes smoked decreased um, modestly. So it decreased from about 12 cigarettes per day at baseline to about 10 cigarettes per day by week four. Exhaled carbon monoxide concentrations followed a similar pattern, roughly um, a decrease of the same magnitude. And um, importantly, motivation to quit increased during this month. So um, this was not a controlled study, so we don't know if that had to do with switching to non-menthol cigarettes or just participating in a study and maybe thinking about changes to smoking behavior. But nonetheless, that was a positive sign that even among those who didn't quit, those who switched to non-menthol cigarettes, their motivation to quit increased. So at the conclusion of the, and at the conclusion of the study, participants indicated that quitting menthol cigarettes was difficult, but they were nonetheless, nonetheless pretty supportive of, a ban of banning menthol. So an average score of seven on a 10 point scale. So our conclusions from this study was that during a simulated ban on menthol cigarettes, most smokers switch to non-menthol cigarettes. And among those that, um, and overall smoking patterns at, at the very least don't suggest increased harm as a result of the switch to non-menthol cigarettes. And in fact, there may be some benefit uh, about 10% attempted to quit, number of cigarettes decreased, exhaled carbon monoxide concentrations decreased, motivation to quit smoking increased, all of those we thought were positive findings. So there was a study done, published last year by Hold and colleagues where um, they wanted to see about the effects of menthol smokers switching to non-menthol cigarettes. So it was a forced switch study again, mimicking what would happen among a fair number of smokers were a ban enacted. So um, 29 non-treatment seeking menthol cigarette smokers switched from their usual brand to non-menthol cigarettes for a two week period. Um, cigarettes were provided to smokers in the study, one week of menthol, two weeks of non-menthol cigarettes were provided to participants. And their results were generally very consistent with um, the previous study that, um, that we that I just described. 
cigarettes per day decreased modestly, roughly by two cigarettes a day, very similar to our findings. In their study, urine, urinary cortney decreased um, significantly, exhaled carbon monoxide decreased. It didn't reach statistical significance, but the magnitude of change was roughly similar to our study. In our study, exhaled carbon monoxide decreased significantly, but actually urinary cortney did not. Um, similar to our study, motivation to quit smoking increased. Um, confidence and ability to quit smoking increased. And they looked at craving and withdrawal in, in a number of measures. And from the Wisconsin smoking withdrawal scale, the craving factor um, decreased significantly as did nicotine dependence. Um, so again, these are all indicators that perhaps among those who don't quit at the time of a cessation of a menthol ban, perhaps it'll be easier for them to quit later on. So um, we in fact wanted to see, is that the case? The switching to non-menthol cigarettes facilitates cessation. So um, as mentioned previously, smoking cessation is more difficult for those smoking menthol versus non-menthol cigarettes. Um, so perhaps switching to non-menthol cigarettes might be an initial step to successful cessation. Um, several studies suggest, as I've just described, that if menthol cigarettes are not available, um, many smokers of menthol cigarettes switch to non-menthol cigarettes. So the question that this, that our, the study I'm about to present tried to address is, is switching to non-menthol cigarettes prior to cessation attempt um, an effective initial step to cessation? There's actually just a paper very recently published um, based on PATH data that found that switching from menthol what to non-menthol versus maintaining menthol use was in fact associated with um, both long, short-term and long-term increases in the probability of, of abstinence. Um, again, in the PATH paper, these were individuals who chose to switch, so which uh, might be different than those who um, really are required to switch because the cigarettes are no longer available. But in the study that we did, we randomized um, African-American menthol smokers to four weeks of either their usual brand cigarettes or to non-menthol cigarettes before a quit attempt. So cigarettes were provided to participants. So we provided them four weeks of either uh, menthol or non-menthol depending on the randomization. Um, we actually, in order to um, not incentivize smokers to smoke more than they otherwise would have because they were getting free cigarettes, um, for any cigarettes that they returned, we added the market value of those cigarettes to the compensation that they received for the study, hoping that that would provide a better um, indicator of how much they would smoke um, if cigarettes were not provided for free as part of the study. Um, in order to approximate the naturalistic environment, we referred and encouraged participants to call the quit line for assistance with their quit attempt but didn't um, otherwise provide quitting assistance. So participants were generally healthy menthol smokers smoking at least five cigarettes per day who expressed an interest in quitting smoking. So rated themselves at least a seven and a 10 point scale assessing motivation to quit smoking. And they also had to be willing to set a quit date. So um, the four weeks of smoking prior to the quit date, the start of those four weeks was based on the quit date that they chose we assessed a number of outcomes, including time to lapse. So the time from when they quit to the first cigarette smoked, time to relapse. Um, that's the number of days from the quit attempt until the first of seven consecutive smoking days. They completed a, a daily tobacco use diary. So we can see number of cigarettes smoked. Motivation to quit was assessed in the pre-quit visits to see if it increased and those who were randomized to the non-menthol cigarettes, support for a menthol cigarette ban was also evaluated during the study. So this was meant to be a pilot feasibility study um, to get initial data. So it wasn't a very large study. We did in, um, randomize 122 participants. So 60 in the menthol group, 62 in the non-menthol group and 107 completed the four-week pre-cessation period. Mean age of participants was in the mid-40s, mid as you can see here. And during that pre-cessation month, what we found was that fewer cigarettes were smoked per day in, non in the non-menthol group. 
So again, very similar to the two other studies that I presented previously. Um, here, the, it was a relatively modest decrease, but nonetheless, it was um, a significant decrease. And you can see the graph here over time. Um, the perceived effectiveness of their skills for quitting smoking was higher in the non-menthol group than in the menthol group. Withdrawal symptom severity was lower in the non-menthol group. Um, again, consistent with some of the other studies presented here. And the support for a ban on menthol and cigarettes was similar between groups. And it, it stayed similar for the entirety of this four week period. And you can see some of the pre-cessation results. Um, this isn't an exhaustive list of all the, of, all of the measures that, um, that we assessed. Um, the paper has more in there. Um, but you can see that exhaled carbon monoxide decreased. And although some of these weren't statistically significant, all of the measures went in, the, in a beneficial direction for switching to non-menthol. So withdrawal symptoms were significantly lower. That's from the Minnesota nicotine withdrawal scale. Um, questionnaire smoking urges, the total score was um, somewhat lower motivation to quit was higher, confidence and ability to quit was higher, effectiveness of quitting skills was significantly higher. You can see the confidence intervals there. Um, support for a menthol ban was pretty constant throughout the study among both groups, and there really wasn't a difference between the groups. So even among those randomized to non-menthol cigarettes, they, their support for a menthol ban didn't decrease, suggesting that if um, a menthol ban is enacted, um, there won't be a decrease in support at that point. So, and these here are the results of the cessation part of the study. So 95 um, participants completed 12 week post cessation visit. Um, the top panel here is the time to lapse. The bottom panel is the time to relapse. So the hazard ratio for time to lapse was 0.82 non-menthol versus menthol. So this wasn't statistically significant, but it was a trend in the right direction. The medium time to lapse in the non-menthol group was two and a half days versus approximately one day in the menthol group. But as you can see that whereas initially there seemed to be separation by day five, um, the, the number, the percentage of those who lapsed was equivalent between the groups. The hazard ratio for time to relapse was 0.67. Um, and the difference was primarily due to lower rates of early relapse in the non-menthol group. So um, a post hack an analysis looking at those who, lapped, who relapsed within the first day of quitting found that 40% of those in the menthol group versus only 21% in those in the non-menthol group relapsed, relapsed within the first day of quitting. So our conclusions here was that the results of the pre-cessation phase of the study was similar to previous studies in which smokers switched to non-menthol cigarettes. Number of cigarettes smoked decreased modestly, but there was a decrease. Few differences were found between groups in most measures. However, perceived effectiveness of sk quitting skills was modestly higher in those switching to non-menthol cigarettes. And again, that's um, generally consistent with the previous studies where motivation to quit increased as a result um, of switching to non-menthol cigarettes. Support for menthol ban did not decrease during study participation. So switching to non-menthol cigarettes may have positive effects on short-term cessation measures. Um, and it looks like at least in our study, this was largely by decreasing the proportion of relapses occurring within the first day of quitting. Now, our it, intervention here was um, we referred individuals to the quit line and fewer than half actually called the quit line. So perhaps more intensive interventions um, would be helpful in sustaining the early abstinence that we saw here. And I think more research is needed on what kinds of interventions are needed to and what kind of public health messaging is needed at the time of a menthol ban rollout to really encourage those who to quit immediately, but also those who don't quit immediately to encourage them to quit um, at a future time because it may be easier for them to quit at that point than it otherwise would have been. 
So overall conclusions are that following a ban of menthol characterizing flavor, many menthol smokers would likely switch to non-menthol cigarettes. A few would likely quit right, would attempt to quit right away, but the majority, perhaps the mass, but the vast majority would switch to non-menthol cigarettes. Those who do switch don't change the smoking behavior in a way that's likely to be more hazardous with some indicators suggesting that there may be some benefits. So decreased smoking, increased measures of motivation to quit. So even if they don't quit right away, they might be more likely to succeed in their cessation attempt down the line. Switching to non-menthol cigarettes may be an effective first step to short-term cessation, but effects are relatively small. However, more research is needed regarding how to sustain any early success that's achieved. So there's been some data from longitudinal studies. And as we heard from the first speaker, there are many localities that are now banning menthol, um, either in all products or only in combustible products and evaluation uh, from um, these localities will help inform effects of menthol, um, of menthol bans. And more research is needed on the effects of either including or excluding menthol, ban um, menthol in bans for other tobacco products. So for example, e-cigarettes on overall tobacco use patterns. So there's some data suggesting that decreasing access to flavored e-cigarettes may increase um, combustible cigarette use. And this is based on studies evaluating um, behavioral economics or discrete choice tasks. Um, we've recently completed a study looking to see whether simulating a ban on menthol in either uh, cigarettes and e-cigarettes or just cigarettes. I don't have that data to present here, but hopefully that data will come out um, soon. Um, so, but that I think is going to be a very important question is if a menthol ban is enacted, how widely and what products should it be enacted on? Should, it, should the menthol ban, if it's also applied to e-cigarettes, will some of those smokers who, know, who would have switched from menthol cigarettes to menthol e-cigarettes otherwise switch to non-menthol cigarettes, um, thereby re, um, diminishing any harm reduction that might occur. I think that's an area that sh um, would, uh, should and likely will be um, evaluated in the future. So I would like to acknowledge collaborators and funders for the work that I presented here. And I think we're taking questions at the end, but I do thank you for your attention. Thank you for another great presentation. And I see a couple questions coming in for you, which we'll save for the end. Um, but uh, thank you again. Um, so we're moving on to our final presentation of the session this morning, uh, which will be given by Mike Cummings. And the title of that presentation is Potential Impact of a Menthol Ban on Smoking Prevalence. So Mike is currently a professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences, also a member of the Hollings Cancer Center's Cancer Prevention and Control Program, where he co-leads the Tobacco Control Research Program. He joined the faculty at the Medical University of South Carolina in 2011. Prior to that, he was at the Roswell Park Cancer Institute in Buffalo. And his training and research interests are in the study of health-related behaviors, specifically tobacco use prevention and cessation. Uh, his focus is on population-based work with a focus on smoking cessation, consumer risk perceptions, the impact of cigarette design on smoking behaviors, and the evaluation of public policies on tobacco use behaviors. Of great importance, um, Mike established the International Tobacco Research Policy Evaluation Project or ITC project to evaluate the behavioral impacts of national level tobacco control policies implemented as part of the WHO Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. The ITC project includes over 100 scientific colleagues around the world, uh, representing more than 20 countries, includes a range of projects that, that deal with biological factors influencing tobacco use to the impact of health warnings and public education campaigns. 
on uh, populations of smokers. And this data source has been really important in driving um, evidence-based policy change by governments and public health advocates around the world. We're thrilled to have Mike presenting this morning. So I will turn it over to you. Okay, thank you. Can you see my screen? Um, can you see my screen? No, we can't see your screen yet. All right, let's maybe house that. Still no. Still no. How's that? Yes, yes. Okay, great. <laughs> Still learning Zoom, even though I should know it better by now. So anyway, uh, let's uh, just move it along and I'll start to go. How's that? Here's my disclosure. Uh, I work at the Medical University of South Carolina. I do a lot of paid expert witness work against the cigarette companies. I don't take money from cigarette or vaping companies. And uh, like many uh, probably participating today, I you know, claim that the, uh, the world would be better off with cigarettes. This talk really would not be possible. I'll be borrowing a lot of information uh, from friends of mine who've been involved in the ITC project, Jeff Fong, Dave uh, Levy, Dave Hammond, and uh, Kathleen East. So you'll be getting a preview of a lot of their work and they were uh, happy to share it with me. Um, basically, the, there's global recommendations for a menthol ban. Uh, as the audience probably realizes, WHO has endorsed this concept. And in fact, many countries around the globe have already uh, introduced uh, menthol cigarette bans. Uh, 27 countries as part of the European Union uh, enacted a menthol ban uh, that began in May of 2020. Uh, Canada was the first country to have uh, an implemented a menthol cigarette ban. Uh, it also applied to small cigars that began in 2017 and predating that were bans in some of their uh, provinces in Canada. And then a number of countries uh, Brazil and others have uh, actually adopted laws, but they've sort of been put on hold. Uh, that was as of uh, May 2020. So how do you go about evaluating the impact of a menthol ban on uh, uh, you know, smoking uh, prevalence? Uh, one way to do it, as I think Michael sort of uh, talked about, some of the research involves uh, asking experts uh, the effects of what a ban would be on cigarette and uh, cigar use. And this was done recently by Dave Levy, an expert elicitation uh, uh, project where he asked a group of experts and you know, shared the available evidence that's there. And you know, their conclusion, according to the expert opinion, you know, a menthol ban is expected to substantially reduce smoking initiation uh, and combustible tobacco use among uh, current uh, menthol smokers. And this just gives you the box plots that were part of it. The panel of experts estimated that menthol cigarettes um, ban would have a bigger effect actually on younger uh, ages where menthol uh, use uh, has a greater impact on initiation. In other words, those you know, taking up smoking are a uh, higher percentage are likely to be uh, selecting mentholated brands uh, and, you know, here he's predicting a 15, this is what the expert panel came up with, a 59% reduction uh, in uh, menthol, you, you know, uh, in cigarette use uh, among uh, the uh, younger group, uh, you know, versus about a 20% in the 35 to 54 year old uh, group. Uh, a similar approach has been uh, applying this effect in populations using uh, simulation modeling. And again, Dave Levy and his team at the University of Georgetown and uh, the University of Michigan recently published this uh, paper where they estimated a menthol ban could save uh, 650,000 lives by 2060. And you know, the, this is showing the model that they applied and then the estimates of what would happen if a menthol ban were implemented in the United States. Uh, I've just summarized there and underlined in red as a result of the ban, overall smoking estimated was estimated to decline by about 15% as early as 2026 uh, due to a menthol smokers quitting both uh, nicotine vaping products and combustible products or switching to MVPs. Uh, so again, 
a positive public health uh, impact. Um, now I'm going to really, uh, you know, switch to the ITC data uh, that has attempted to actually gather data on what happened with menthol bans that were implemented. The ITC study uh, has been uh, done in uh, a variety of countries around the world, Canada being one of them. And uh, uh, our survey was in place in 2016 before Canada implemented their menthol ban, and then in 2018 afterwards. So it allowed for a, a natural experiment to see what would happen. Um, so we had uh, a total of 20, uh, 1,236 adult smokers, 138 were menthol smokers versus uh, the large share who do not smoke uh, menthol in Canada. So menthol cigarettes are much more popular in the United States than they are in other parts of the world, and that includes Canada. Uh, these are the seven provinces, uh, which covered about 83% of the Canadian population that had already enacted menthol bans uh, before uh, the federal law uh, took effect. And this just gives you the timing of our surveys. So what we found, uh, bottom line, is uh, there was an increase in uh, quit attempts, uh, you know, uh, uh, menthol smokers, uh, you know, basically 58.7% uh, between 2016 and 2018 reported having made a quit attempt versus the non-menthol. So that's a difference of a, about 9.7%. Very uh, similar, by the way. It's nice to see uh, Michael's work in his experiments. That's very uh, consistent with uh, what we observed on a population-wide basis. Uh, quit success, uh, was lower, 21%, uh, and this is measured, uh, by the way, as uh, uh, not smoking uh, uh, for at least one month uh, when we followed them up in 2018. Uh, for menthol smokers, 21%, among the non-menthol smokers, 11.6, that's a difference of 9.4. Um, quick success, if you just, uh, that was daily smokers. If you look at all smokers, it's a little less, 7.5. Uh, so taking account of the non-dailies there and staying quit uh, among smokers quit before the ban. So looking at relapse, uh, we also see a benefit uh, associated with that. And Jeff Fong did uh, some back of the uh, envelope calculations to uh, apply this in the United States, where obviously we have a much uh, larger percentage of the population smoking mentholated brands. Uh, and so the effects would be, you know, much greater here in the United States and, you know, proportionally greater among African-American smokers who have a preference for menthol cigarettes. We also looked at this in uh, Europe. There's a, uh, a study that uh, Jeff and his team have uh, also done in collaboration with colleagues in the Netherlands, uh, where uh, they had an IT stu ITC study in place longitudinally to look at the effects of the menthol ban that took place there. Uh, so this is just showing you the design of the study, but very similar to Canada, but this is looking at the Netherlands. Here's the uh, bottom line responses there to the menthol ban among those who reported that they were smoking menthol cigarettes before the ban. And uh, some, about 10% again, you know, uh, said they uh, would quit entirely. 21% said they would, you know, they reduced their smoking. Um, many uh, indicated they would, uh, you know, they stayed with, uh, they, they stayed with, you know, simply switched to non-menthol brands. Uh, or uh, in Europe, and particularly in the Netherlands, there's a high percentage of the population that uh, utilize a uh, roll your own cigarettes because of the high price of cigarettes. Uh, in the Netherlands. And of course, uh, menthol gets into cigarettes uh, primarily through the packaging or through the filter tip. So some of the smokers indicated uh, moving to roll your own with uh, menthol cigarettes that were uh, sold separately from the tobacco, uh, smoked other menthol products like cigars, used an e-cigarette, and uh, found other ways to get around uh, the ban. Again, Europe, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, you know, shifting of tobacco that goes across uh, borders there. But the conclusion from the Netherlands is very similar to what we saw in Canada, the use of menthol cigarettes among smokers in the Netherlands decreased shortly after the implementation of the EU menthol ban. The ban was associated with quitting among pre-ban menthol smokers compared to the non-menthol smokers. Uh, but this was only significant for the females. That you know, could be due to the uh, statistical power issue uh, when you, you know, look at the 
relatively small percentage of menthol smokers in the study, and then you start dividing them up by uh, gender and other characteristics. Uh, most smokers reported either switching to non-menthol cigarettes or continuing to smoke menthol cigarettes. Post-ban menthol use uh, does not appear to be due to you know, smuggling or illicit trade, at least in the short term. Haven't been very many studies uh, done among youth. This is a paper that Kathleen uh, East uh, presented uh, recently at SRNT Europe, uh, and she and her colleagues Dave Hammond and uh, Jessica Reed and uh, Robin uh, uh, Burkhalter uh, presented data from Dave Hammond's uh, ITC uh, youth and young adult um, uh, cross-sectional studies that have been conducted in England, Canada, and the U.S. Uh, over different time periods. So this was a study really designed to look at the uh, uh, effect of the menthol ban that went effect, it took effect in England uh, on uh, adolescents age 16 to 19. So here it gives you the, the law. So, you know, as I mentioned already, Canada already had a law in place. So that's a country that had a law. So October, 2017, the law took, went into effect in May. And obviously here in the US, we haven't uh, had a, a national ban yet. Uh, there's differences in the marketplace. This is, uh, as I've mentioned before, menthol market in Canada is about 4.5. In uh, England, it's a little bit higher, about 21%. In the US uh, in 2018, it was about 36%. Uh, and that's among youth, and those are based on our uh, surveys there. Uh, aims and hypotheses was really to test whether they, what the effect of the menthol ban uh, was on the adolescents in England uh, versus Canada that already had the ban or the US, which had no ban. So this is the basic quasi-experimental design uh, that uh, we utilized here. Uh, these are the sample sizes, so they're pretty substantial. It includes, uh, interestingly, non-smokers as well as uh, smokers, but these uh, uh, results are uh, restricted to those who reported uh, being past 30-day uh, smokers at the time. Uh, so what specific uh, brand variety of cigarettes or roll your own tobacco do you currently smoke most often? That's the key outcome variable that was assessed, uh, and there are a variety of ways to get people menthol cigarettes. We know that uh, you know, the menthol cigarettes directly, plus the uh, filters where you can click on the filter tip and the capsule releases the, the menthol flavor. Uh, the US uh, population, uh, this is just showing you, and it's vastly different when you look at the other uh, countries in terms of who uses uh, menthol cigarettes, but in the US we do see uh, differences by uh, uh, racial uh, characteristics. Uh, that's well known, I'm sure, to this audience, but just uh, to remind you of the difference. So did menthol ban reduce youth smoking? Um, you know, in, in the US uh, where there was no real change, this is just showing you the percentage of 16 to 19 year old youth uh, that reported uh, smoking a menthol brand, uh, not a real big change there, slight uptick uh, there in August of uh, 2020. This is looking at Canada, you know, it was low and it's slightly, uh, you know, stayed fairly stable. Uh, uh, in the range between you know two and three percent, basically, and this is uh, in England, uh, where the menthol ban went in effect in May of 2020. So you know the February 2020 was the pre, and you can see the post in August. So that would suggest a, a fairly big effect on the selection of menthol cigarettes, which you'd expect, I think, to be going down among uh, youth. Uh, one of the questions, of course, is what effect did it have on overall smoking prevalence. This is again showing you data uh, from Canada, England, and the US. The good news is those trends are going down. Uh, and in England, uh, it was a little higher for really unknown reasons. It, it you know, seemed to pop up uh, to about 19.6% um, just prior to the ban. That's February, and it looks like it went down. So it certainly wasn't increasing the prevalence of smoking, may have increased. Uh, or re help reduce the prevalence of smoking, but really can't say that's uh, due uh, specifically to the menthol ban. So, you know, some take home messages from, you know, the findings that I've reviewed, uh, thanks to my colleagues, uh, clear impact of menthol cigarette ban on reducing the proportion of youth and adult smokers who smoke a menthol brand. So when you implement the bans, you know, the menthol rate goes down. Menthol cigarette bans resulted in higher rates of quit attempts and success 
in quitting among uh, menthol smokers, and that's particularly adult smokers. Uh, very consistent, I think, with the data that uh, that Michael reported from his uh, uh, you know experiments. It is uh, likely that the overall smoking prevalence would drop. Uh, and I would just highlight the most recent modeling study of Dave Levy and his colleagues predicting about a 15% reduction uh, by 2026. Uh, so I wanna thank our ITC supporters, the National Cancer Institute, the National Institutes of Health Research and others that have uh, supported the work that we've done over the years. And that's the end of my talk. And there's the end in green. Hopefully we can get around to uh, getting rid of the menthol cigarettes. So thanks very much. Thank you, Mike. What a great talk and really promising um, evidence, especially from, from the UK ban on menthol. So we'll open it up now to, um, to questions. We have a few questions in the chat. Um, and so we are, we, I will start with some questions, but please feel free to add questions. We're not sure if the Q&A is working right now, the function. So if you wanna add your questions to the chat, please do. So I will start with a question um, for Pebbles, which is if you can comment on the low, a low nicotine strategy as an equitable approach to address the harm caused by cigarettes. Yes, yes, thank you for that question. Um, actually, from a social justice perspective, we would say that that is not an equitable approach um, because um, communities of disadvantage suffer from multiple issues, not just the tobacco use. So there's substance use addiction um, overall with regard to alcohol use, um, use of marijuana, um, is also high um, in the population which we're working and it goes beyond our population. Um, you always see uh, dual use or poly use of nicotine plus marijuana plus alcohol. Then you add on social disadvantage um, and uh, systematic racism. And so a harm, harm reduction approaches for communities who are already experiencing disadvantage or problematic because you're not actually getting to the point of eliminating harm for those population groups. So this particular approach by most communities um, are not even interested in harm reduction approaches. What they're most interested in is how do we get out of these circumstances? Not partly out of the circumstances, but how do we get out of these circumstances completely? And so the other perspective related to harm reduction approaches is that we haven't even done a good job of trying to reach these populations with evidence-based practices. So these populations have had limited exposure to quit lines. When we asked about the methods that they've used for quitting, and, and this goes beyond our study, but for, in particular for rural populations, if we haven't even tried to reach them very well with evidence-based practices, why would we skip that phase for these populations and cut them short and move towards harm reduction? There's nothing wrong with harm reduction in and of itself, but from the perspective of populations that haven't even been reached with evidence-based practice, they deserve, they have the right, and they are entitled to that in the same way that other populations are entitled to. That's a social justice approach for these particular groups. Thank you. We have a couple questions for Dr. Kotler. Um, the first is in the forced menthol ban studies, how do you verify that participants who switch to non-menthol cigarettes are truly only smoking non-menthol products. Yeah, so that is one of the limitations of the studies is that um, we didn't have a way to verify that in fact they were only smoking non-menthol. We considered measuring menthol concentrations, but there is also menthol in food products. So it 
would be difficult to verify if they've been completely abstinent or not. We did tell participants in all of these studies to report if they've smoked any cigarettes not in their randomized group. So for example, in the RCT, about 10% of cigarettes smoked among those assigned to non-menthol were reported to be menthol cigarettes. Um, the number of cigarettes smoked and the figure that I provided is actually the total number reported, both menthol and non-menthol. So, and that's one of the limitations and perhaps is underestimating the effect that we would see with an actual ban is that um, if somebody, if a participant really feels like they need a menthol cigarette, they still have access to it. And perhaps that dissuades them from quitting or undermines a cessation attempt. So we rely on self-report, but we don't penalize participants for reporting that they did smoke a menthol cigarette. Great, thank you. And one more question for you. Uh, what brands did you give smokers in the randomized controlled trial? Did you assess appeal of the product when you switched menthol to non-menthol? Um, so in the randomized controlled trial, we tried to keep it as close to naturalistic setting as possible. So we asked participants, what's your usual brand um, for those randomized to menthol and what's their preferred brand for those randomized to non-menthol? If they didn't indicate a preferred brand, we then provided the non-menthol version of their preferred menthol brand. Um, the most common by far brand smoked of menthol was Newport with a number of other brands interspersed. We did uh, measure um, cigarette evaluation scale and we actually found very few differences in um, the acceptability of the um, cigarettes, which was somewhat surprising in that the smokers who switched to non-menthol reported very similar ratings on acceptability of the cigarettes as those who stayed with menthol. Um, I'm not, and there are obviously other data out there suggesting that menthol cigarettes don't find non-menthol cigarettes, menthol smokers don't find non-menthol cigarettes as appealing, but we didn't see large differences, perhaps a very small um, very small um, effects in terms of slightly less acceptable, but that I'm not sure I would make a whole lot of a lot out of that because they were quite small and certainly not statistically significant. And final question for you right now. Um, did you use a purchase task or any other task to assess their willingness to purchase the non menthol product. We, we didn't. Um, we tried to balance getting as much data as we can without overburdening participants where we were already trying to follow them for a while. So um, we thought that we would just see how much would they use and try to incent and try to not incentivize using more than they otherwise would by essentially um, anything that they bring back. We added the market value to the compensation that they got for the study. So and hopefully we got a pretty good measure of, um, of what they used and what they would be willing to use, but obviously that is a limitation as well. Thank you. Um, so I can see that Mike Cummings is answering questions in the Q&A, so, um, but I think there's, um, I think potentially of relevance to everyone, a question for you, Mike. Um, so for youth who continue smoking menthol cigarettes, even after Canada and the UK's bans, what are their primary means of accessing those menthol cigarettes? Yeah, uh, well, the primary means uh, in, in Europe, I, you know, basically, I mean, it's retail uh, locations. Um, and, but in Canada, uh, there, you know, the First Nation reserves uh, are not affected. Uh, they're excluded from their federal law that bans uh, menthol and cigarettes and cigars. And, you know, we certainly know there's a, a fair amount of, particularly in the, some of the urban areas around Toronto and others that where, you know, cigarettes get into circulation off of the reserves. Um, that's, a, you know, I guess you could call that illicit. It's price driven because of, you know, the higher taxes from the national government, uh, which are excluded. So that could be a, a potential uh, source. In, in Europe, I mentioned uh, roll your own is fairly common also in England. And uh, 
Uh, you know, they are selling, you know, the companies, not surprisingly, have come up with their workarounds, all kinds of things, a packaging with uh, menthol. You can take the cigarettes that you purchase and put them in containers that, you know, will infuse the cigarettes with menthol. You know, most people think menthol is in the tobacco. It is not. It's usually in the packaging and in the filter. And so, and again, with Roll Your Own, you can sell this, you know, the filter plugs separately and they could have either the capsules uh, with, the, with the flavoring in them. So there are workarounds and I'm not sure how uh, the governments are addressing them in terms of compliance, but as we know in tobacco control, the industry uh, will do whatever it can, can to you know, keep their customers happy and, and uh, addicted. And I'll just add to the roll your own comment. I have a project with Ted Wagner where we uh, looked at a number of menthol cigarette substitutes and we just finished collecting data. Uh, roll your own was one of those options, um, but we actually provided pre, pre-rolled uh, roll your own products, which used a menthol tube that is just sort of the exterior of the cigarette with menthol pipe tobacco. Um, and that seemed to be uh, a, an appealing one of our pot potential substitutes. So um, I have a question for everyone um, that is a, a sort of a political opinion question. Uh, why do you think FDA has been hesitating on a ban on menthol given the evidence? I don't know who wants to take that first. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm happy to start because I think, um, you know, uh, the the issue is complicated by profits, and um, what is important I think for people to understand um, is that, um, you know, menthol cigarettes are used by lots of population groups and not just African-Americans, uh, but they are still about 20 something percent of the uh, uh, sales for cigarettes. So there are profits involved. And what's unfortunate is that um, the federal government is sacrificing people's lives for the sake of profits. But at the same time, they've approved other mentholated products to go into the market, um, which then advances industry, but it doesn't benefit necessarily the populations who are already disproportionately impacted. And so from a social justice perspective, you know, to not protect those populations through policies, but yet to approve additional products on the market that helps the profit of industry is socially unjust. And so uh, we have to begin to examine how we make decisions on uh, what benefits population groups and what harms population groups. And that model has to take into consideration the most vulnerable groups because it currently does not. Um, so, you know, we, we've got to take a very different lens when we're looking at how policy decisions are made for vulnerable population groups. Yeah, I, I can add a little bit of a legal color to this. Um, and, and first, I noticed that there was a question about the difference between a product standard versus substantial equivalence. So I'll wrap that in here. So a pro both of these uh, concepts are specific powers that were created by the Tobacco Control Act in 2009. A product standard is the power to create a, a standard that applies across all products. It's a very broad power. Since 2009, the, the FDA has had the power to do it and they haven't done it once. And it's a very cautious agency as everybody knows. And I think that there's a fair amount of uh, hesitancy to do something wrong the first time. And maybe they're being too cautious, maybe they're not, but they, you know, 
12 years have passed and they haven't done it yet. And now they're probably going to do it soon. So I think they're being very careful and trying not to start off on the wrong foot. Uh, everyone may recall back in 2011, they introduced uh, graphic warnings for cigarette packs and right out of the gates, they lost a crucial lawsuit on that. And that's another thing that the FDA is doing slowly. Anyway, product standards can affect the whole market. Substantial equivalence is a very different animal where the, the FDA is looking at products product by product, where products are seeking authorization to stay on the market. Uh, so, so that's a very different animal. But I think the, the, there's this uh, very broad cautiousness of not winning the first fight um, when, when the FDA finally gets around to passing a product standard. I, I would only add, uh, and, I, and I think that's a, an accurate uh, review of the history <laughs> uh, that we've had, because you know, obviously advisory boards have been uh, recommending to the FDA to ban menthol for a while, but the standard itself takes a while. I mean, there are steps that are required that are part of the law. We may not like those steps, uh, but the FDA is mandated to go through those uh, steps. Um, we would have liked to see that moving ahead uh, sooner. I think the cautiousness is looking at the evidence that's uh, you know coming out and the studies that have uh, you know been talked about today. I think are quite relevant to you know FDA's ability to define uh, that the uh, population benefit will be seen and is uh, uh, worth the economic costs because there are going to be you know I didn't. I chose Newport for the cover of my uh, slide on purpose. I mean, R.J. Reynolds in 2015 purchased Laurel Art Tobacco's Laurel, you know, Newport brand, the most popular mentholated brand for $27.1 billion. There's a lot of money on the line. And FDA will obviously be sued. We've seen California get sued. Um, and, you know, FDA's got to pick its fights. That's why I asked uh, Pebbles the question about the nicotine standard, which I think you know um, gets to the heart of smoking addiction and uptake and would affect all smokers, whether they're smoking menthol or non-menthol cigarettes. Um, uh, and I think both are, 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 you know, I think we would like to see the appeal of cigarettes go away. It's a deadly, dangerous, defective product. Uh, but the, uh, just having spent the last three days on the witness stand in a case up in Massachusetts, I can tell you there's an army of lawyers who are uh, knocking on FDA's door and watching carefully what's going to happen. And they have to you know, follow the law as we would want them to do, follow the science, which they're gonna have to present and convince the courts because this will ultimately be litigated in the courts. And uh, I'm glad that uh, the public health community has sued the FDA to force them to act. And, you know, that's a good lesson for a lot of different, you know, uh, I'm, I'm waiting for the lawsuit uh, on behalf of addicted smokers uh, because uh, we ought to take the nicotine level down in uh, combustible tobacco products. Also, that's an important uh, standard as well. And it's science-based. And it really puts a dagger in the heart of uh, the defective cigarette that should not even be on the market. But, you know, Congress, in their wisdom, said you can't ban a class of tobacco products. That's part of the law. Any other comments from the panel on that question? <laughs> OK, I have. Uh, a question sort of that piggybacks on what you said, Kevin, about this is the first product standard that they will introduce. But so how I think the first thing that came into effect was the ban on flavored cigarettes, um, which which happened, you know, right at the time of the act coming in. So how um, how did that process differ, do you think, from what we're what they're proposing for menthol cigarettes? And certainly the evidence that we have on menthol cigarettes is much more vast than what they had at that time on flavored cigarettes. Yeah, so in 2009, when the Tobacco Control Act uh, was passed, it 
explicitly said that flavored cigarettes are banned. And for menthol cigarettes, it explicitly said, this is an issue that's pretty important, but for these, and it, what was not said was that there's a lot of political pressure on us and political donations. Um, so instead of doing something concretely, we're going to punt this uh, to uh, a board, the TIPSAC board, scientific advisory board to think about it. So that's that led to the TIPSAC report from 2011, which came out in pretty strong terms saying that menthol is a public health hazard. So, but the product, so, so but the, the crux of your question, I think, is what's the difference between a law and the rulemaking process? The, a law is a simpler legal uh, tool that is less vulnerable to challenge and quicker to go into effect. So that's why flavored cigarettes were able to be banned quickly, efficiently through that 2009 law. The rulemaking process, and I um, outlined this really briefly in my slide that showed the timeline, and, and uh, Michael uh, alluded to this, there's a lot of requirements that have to be met that are part of not just the Tobacco Control Act, um, but also the Administrative Procedure Act, and also rules and regulations that the FDA has been writing over the past several years. And every step of the way, there's procedures that must be met, and those procedures do tie into scientific evidence. So certain thresholds have to be met uh, very carefully at prescribed times uh, over the course of years. And the tobacco industry has high paid lawyers who are watching very closely to see, to look for any opportunity uh, to make an argument, not even to find a mistake, but to make an argument that a mistake was made. And when they get those opportunities, uh, they will try to capitalize on them. And that's part of why the FDA uh, tries to move so slowly and so carefully. Thank you, that's helpful. Um, I have another question for Dr. Kotler. Have you considered a condition of switching non-menthol smokers to menthol prior to quitting to parse brand switching from the influence of menthol specifically? Yeah, I think that would be a very interesting study to do. Um, we've focused, been, been focusing mostly on what would the effects be of a menthol ban, which is why we've been switching menthol to non-menthol. But certainly it might be that some of the effects that we see is just switching people from a preferred cigarette to something that they don't, that isn't their usual, isn't their preferred cigarette. And there might be differences among cigarettes as well in terms of nicotine levels, other characteristics that um, we can't necessarily control for. So I think it would be a fascinating study to do, but it's not one that we've, that, that we've worked on. And we have another question in the chat um, that is, how do we exclude the possible menthol effect from another source such as food or gum or beverage? And I'm not sure exactly what this refers to in terms of an effect, but I believe that you mentioned, Dr. Kotler, that the issue with assessing, you know, doing any sort of biochemical verification of menthol would include those sources and would be hard to, harder to parse. Yeah, and I guess, um, and menthol is um, in a number of food sources, and I don't know if there's much literature on how on if smokers, perhaps if menthol cigarettes weren't available, if they would, if uh, smokers would uh, look for menthol from these other sources and how that would um, ultimately affect a ban. I imagine it would be different if you eat it as opposed to inhale um, cigarette smoke, but I don't know the literature there well enough to say conclusively. I don't know if others perhaps can comment. I have one comment, um, you know, and Michael's mentioned this and one of my slides uh, alluded, uh, pointed to this idea that in some countries uh, where there are menthol bans, there's these products that are available where you can mentholate your own 
cigarettes. And if you if you just look on Amazon, uh, you you find that it's not just a few. This is an emerging space, and a lot of uh, entrepreneurial companies are trying to jump into it, and they're introducing all kinds of little gadgets that can help not just mentalize but flavor your your cigarettes. And I looked at the Tobacco Control Act and thought about what the tobacco, what the FDA could regulate. And it appears that these types of devices are subject to FDA authority as additives. Initially, I was wondering if they were tobacco products or not, but I think the definition of additive is broad enough to cover these uh, devices. Even though they don't contain tobacco, they're, uh, they appear to be produced for the specific purpose of being part of a tobacco consumption experience. So they think they'd fit that definition. And obviously uh, we, one would hope that the FDA would keep that in mind uh, as it moves forward. Very interesting, especially in light of the way that uh, e-cigarette devices and constituents sort of were, were uh, described in deeming we might think about these other products as being falling under that umbrella. Um, so another question for the whole panel, what are your perceptions of states that are enacting bans? Um, do you think that there's a way to speed this process along by getting Congress to ban menthol uh, rather than going through the rulemaking process at FDA? That would be a whole lot faster. I mean, my, my uh, timeline suggests that a product standard could take four years to five years. I was on an industry call where uh, an analyst uh, estimated that it could take eight years. Um, it's, it's difficult to say. A law could take effect much more quickly. I, I agree with that. I mean, Congress is the one that created the problem. They had the opportunity back in 2009 when they passed the act not to ex make an exception for menthol and require the FDA to undertake a study of it. Um, so that, that was the tip off there. And they could fix this problem uh, overnight. That's how, that's how come we have laws in 35 other countries. Uh, they're not going through a standard making process to do this. They're government, uh, you know, uh, decision makers are passing laws to ban uh, the menthol in, in cigarettes and cigars. That's how Canada has done it, how the EU has done it, how Chile has done it, how the other countries around the world are doing it. Uh, only in the U.S. have we created the Full Employment Act for lawyers. Uh, so, uh, and I, I worry about states moving forward on this, since that was also mentioned, uh, because it opens the door for illicit markets to be created. Uh, the states are not set up to do the enforcement that would be required around this. They don't have the technical capability to do it. Um, and, you know, that's why we have the Tobacco Control Act anyway, in place with the FDA, which we all, you know, supported. Uh, but it, it's a pretty clunky process. And uh, I think Congress could clean up the menthol issue just by adding it to one of these reconciliation bills and slipping it in. And there you'd have it. And it would be done overnight. There, there was a bill in 2019 that was introduced in the House of Representatives that could have accomplished this. Um, but I don't think it has any prospects of passing in the near future. Reconciliation, you know, maybe uh, Joe, Joe Manson wouldn't care about menthol cigarettes. I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, elections matter. And that's how we could probably change this because I'm, I'm discouraged. I mean, it's great. There's science here. We see what's going on in other countries and we should continue the research, but more research is needed. You know, Pebbles is going to tell us what, uh, you know, no more research is needed. We can see the higher rates of, in South Carolina of lung cancer among African-Americans that we see here, and it's due to menthol cigarettes. The research that is needed is how do we help people 
quit if there is a policy that is passed or not, right? We're in a situation where there's nothing. So we still have to move forward with research um, to help people quit. I can remember we submitted a menthol grant uh, back, maybe it was five years ago. And one of the comments I got in my summary statement was this study, it was on cessation. And this study is not needed because the FDA is going to ban menthol anyway. I mean, how, I mean, so, but that's among our researchers, right? And so, um, you know, we're kind of uh, killing ourselves with this process because we don't know what FDA is going to do. We can guesstimate how long this process is going to take, um, maybe another 20 years, uh, but we still have to have studies that help us figure out how to get people off of tobacco products. And so um, that push has to continue. It has to move forward. Um, I mean, the, the evidence is there. We know that menthol smokers have greater difficulty quitting that we don't have to keep proving that over and over again. But we, what we do have to do is to move towards getting people off of the um, The other thing, to say is that you know um you know as we are trying to understand terminology like what is a product standard you know what is the process for rulemaking um and understanding those things help us to move things forward i would encourage people to understand what social justice means that's why i kind of introduced a snippet of it today but there's a whole field out there. And I think a lot of times we use terminology and we just throw them around like product standard, not understanding what it means, rulemaking process, we don't understand what it means. We throw out social justice, we don't understand what it means. And one of the principles of social justice that I talked about earlier is this understanding and knowledge creation. And so we as practitioners and researchers have to be part of creating an understanding of what social justice means. If you understand it, then a term gets used in the appropriate way and not gets misused and abused. Um, we don't want that for any terminology, for social justice, product standard, understanding rulemaking processes. And so I think we need to take a step back and, and, and learn because it's not a commonly used term in tobacco control in terms of, you know, social justice comes from other fields. And um, we have to educate ourselves about, you know, other disciplines so that we have a really good understanding of how to move it forward. If we don't, we can tend to misuse the terminology, throw it out there, not really understanding what it means. And we want people to understand it. In the same way, we want people to understand what a product standard is or what the rulemaking process entails as well. I have just a, one other point I wanted to throw in. And uh, just on the issue of whether states should move forward with menthol bans, I, I have a slight difference of opinion with uh, with Michael on that. Um, I, I agree with him that it's complicated and it's not pretty and there it could contribute to illicit markets. But I do think partly in large part because of the the time it takes for the FDA to move forward and, and will likely take to move forward with this, that I think that we can make progress with uh, states and local governments moving forward with menthol bans. Obviously, you know, there, it's complicated, it's difficult, enforcement is challenging, and illicit markets are there. But I do think that progress can be made. And, and, and one way that it makes progress is it encourages other localities to do it. And it shows momentum that might ultimately help uh, us to move forward on a federal level. Fair point, yeah. I agree. So I have a question for both of you um, and then a question for Dr. Fagan. So um, Kevin and Mike, please comment on the risk if FDA product standard reviews are indeed focusing exclusively on toxicity. Um, that would mean that they're not addressing product features impacting appeal that are maybe the most important factors that underpin abuse liability. 
you know, my, my, I'm, a, I'm a strong supporter. I have a petition before the FDA to ask uh, the FDA to follow through on Dr. Gottlieb's original nicotine-focused regulation, which the cornerstone was uh, a, a nicotine standard uh, for combustible tobacco, which is uh, not about toxicity, it's about behavior. It's eliminating dependence, giving people choice cigarettes rather than need cigarettes. And personally, I, you know, I, I think the menthol issue uh, should have been solved by Congress back in 2009. Uh, they shouldn't have had an exclusion. Um, and it's been sort of a, I view it as a little bit of a distraction. It is a social justice issue given, you know, the disparities that we see in, you know, who's using menthol cigarettes. Um, but um, I would be concerned from the comment or the chat uh, comment that FDA focus only on toxicity. I don't believe they are. And I still hear Mitch Zeller talking about the nicotine focused uh, regulatory policy. And uh, when he stops doing that, I'll, I'll be sad. <laughs> but uh, he still mentions it and it's going to be a hard one to implement as well, because the, this is really a fight over the industry as a whole, over the cigarette makers um, as a whole. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I, I think it would be just unbelievably impactful if a low nicotine standard went into effect. The, the, I just want to point out that the question uh, highlights the idea of product standard and toxicity. And in my slides, and I don't want there to be uh, confusion about this. I mentioned toxicity as opposed to flavors and appeal, but not in the product standard context. I was talking about the uh, substantial equivalent process uh, where the FDA is looking to authorize products one by one, as I mentioned, like product standards across, cut across the whole market. Substantial equivalence and FDA authorization is a product by product process. And as they go, th and, and this, it's not unimportant, but it's not nearly as significant and impactful as product standards. But it's, it, it could be important if they were, if the FDA were using its gatekeeping authority to prevent uh, attractive new products from getting on the market. Um, and if they don't prevent attractive new products from getting on the market, then it's, it's kind of a tool that the FDA was given that it's really not using to the full extent possible. So my, my concern is that when the FDA gets an application for a cigar that's introduced to the market recently, you know, in the last two years, and it's called like banana smash, and it sounds pretty cool. Um, it's got an attractive label, it's got an attractive name, it's colorful. Um, and the, the application says, this is substantially equivalent to a grape cigar that was on the market, introduced to the market in 2005. Okay, so this grape cigar from 2005, let's say its sales were mediocre and Banana Smash is introduced now and it has this great package that's gonna get people's attention when they see it behind the counter at a gas station. Um, and the toxicity in both cigars is similar. The FDA appears to be looking at the at Banana Smash and saying that's substantially equivalent to wine uh, from 2005. So I'm going to say it's authorized to be on the market. Well, that's an opportunity lost. Uh, the FDA could have said Banana Smash, uh, you know, there, the evidence that we've seen does not suggest that this product is gonna be really attractive to young people. Um, so what, if the FDA wants to use this gatekeeping authority in a way that really makes a difference, I think that they should be considering how potentially appealing a product is to, to young people. Yeah, Kevin, you know, one of the things that um, relates to that is the FDA did try to extend uh, the review of substantial equivalence to, you know, beyond the, the chemistry and, you know, mutagenicity of the product and some of the things that, you know, 
uh, they do look at, uh, they tried to extend it to the package and they uh, were sued and they lost. Um, and that's a real problem. Um, I think you're commenting on it, but that's, that's why we see these applications going forward and FDA, you know, is very, they've been narrow and how they review applications for substantial equivalence. And it's, um, you know, it's a problem. You know, maybe we need to have FDA hire better lawyers. Now, that, that, that is true. I neglected to mention that lawsuit and that certainly does handcuff the FDA a bit. Just an aside question, how many of the new flavored and menthol products um, specifically cigarettes and cigars that have come on the market since 2009, do you think have gone through the new product application process? C cigarettes were required to go through that process go dating back to somewhere around 2011. Um, cigars uh, and, and e-cigarettes were not required to start going through the process until last September. And we're just we've just re reached the one year uh, cutoff period by which the FDA was supposed to complete uh, these applications. Now, it turned out that if you just look at the, the e-cigarettes, they were confronted with like probably hundreds of thousands of applications and they need more time to do them. They, they've not made decisions on some of the most important flavored e-cigarettes on the, or e-cigarettes generally on the market. For cigars, um, it's similar. They're kind of overwhelmed. They have more applications than they can handle. They had a court, again, they, they were slow to move forward with one of these things and, and tobacco control advocates sued them uh, to get a court to tell them to move faster. And the court did. And the FDA is seems to be doing its best, but can't quite keep up with these court ordered deadlines. Um, so I don't know how many applications they've handled, but I think it's a small fraction of the number that were totally submitted. Yeah, they received over 6 million product uh, applications. Uh, they have dismissed a number of them, um, you know, because of the uh, errors in the application. Those applications can come back, uh, but they have issued some cease and desist orders. Uh, for uh, some e-cigarettes, as you know. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, the area that I think is interesting, I'm glad you raised substantial equivalence. There's a lot of activity in the substantial equivalence category. And uh, folks who are interested, you know, might want to, you know, go in and look at, you know, the uh, uh, technical uh, product uh, leadership reports uh, that, uh, you know, give you, an, uh, you know, their rulings on these products. Some of them are uh, redacted, uh, but you can get a pretty good idea of the products that they're reviewing. Many of them are cigars, many of them are cigarettes. Um, and, you know, this is the process the companies are required to do when they go to modify a product. Uh, and, and their argument is that it's just a substantially equivalent to a predicate product already existing in the marketplace. So e-cigarettes are more likely to have to go the PMTA route because they're um, uh, of the deeming rule that went into effect in August of 2016. And most of those products didn't exist at that time. So final question, very relevant to this conversation. Um, can the panel comment on how the recent and ongoing flavored e-cigarette PMTA decisions interact with a potential menthol cigarette ban? Well, they don't, and they do. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, they're talking about a cigarette and a small cigar uh, uh, standard. That was what FDA put out in their press release when they said they were going to reconsider this issue. Um, and now they have, they're confronted with a variety of PMTAs, uh, you know, with, product, uh, with products with different flavors. And if you're watching uh, what they've been approving and disapproving, uh, it does seem like uh, they have been uh, eliminating a lot of flavors, but uh, the question of what they're gonna do with menthol in some of these alternatives is really unclear. 
Um, and so, you know, just like the football games coming up this weekend, we could take bets on which one, you know, where it's going to go, uh, because we really don't know what they're going to do. I mean, I would like to see some differentiation of uh, restrictions in lower risk products versus cigarettes and combustible high risk products. Uh, you know, that gives an incentive for consumers to get off the high risk products and go to a lower risk product. I think that's important, but others disagree. Um, so I'm not sure where they're going to come down on menthol. I'll give you my bet. I, I think they are going to approve some menthol products. Uh, this is a really interesting question. It raises some interesting broad points. And I'm actually going to switch a little bit in the state and local direction on this point. Because when you look at flavors and you look at e-cigarettes versus combustibles, I, I see like a number of local jurisdictions going after flavored e-cigarettes and ignoring flavored combustible products like menthol cigarettes and flavored cigars. And I think that that's not the right approach. I think prioritizing menthol cigarettes uh, because they're the most dangerous uh, and prioritizing flavored cigars because they're also extremely dangerous. They're combustible, they're flavored, they're attractive, they're used by a lot of young people. I think that's the most important priority. And with that in mind, I wouldn't be surprised if the FDA um, does uh, consider uh, uh, authorizing more menthol flavored e-cigarettes I don't love that idea, but I, I do think the most important thing is to prioritize combustible flavored products. Any other comments from the panel? I'll, I'll make one final comment. I think we have to go to the bigger question is, why does industry use flavor in tobacco products in the first place? Um, and uh, why do they use it? What impact does it have on users? And who are the users that it has an impact on? And so when we think about that, um, because this is an industry kind of promoted um, factor, this putting flavors into tobacco, into alcohol products. There's a reason why flavors are in alcohol products as well. And they appeal to certain population groups as too. And so, you know, I, I would challenge the um, audience to think about that bigger question and who's most impacted by these flavored products, whether they are um, cigarettes, cigars, smokeless tobacco, or e-cigarettes. And I want to go back to the issue of social justice and kind of the principle of self-determination, which is really allowing people to control certain aspects of their lives. Population groups who are disproportionately impacted by tobacco do not have the ability to control certain aspects of their lives when these products are target marketed to their communities repeatedly over decades when industry interferes by uh, co-opting silence in communities against speaking out against industry and co-opting voices to speak on behalf of industry's position, such as cigarette taxes are regressive on poor populations. That's an industry message that, go, that uh, came through unions because tobacco industry co-opted that um, or that um, uh, the ban on airlines and uh, co-opting messages around secondhand smoke exposure to prevent the ban of smoking on airlines. That was a whole issue where, uh, where industry interfered. Now we see industry interference related to menthol and other flavors. And they have bought silence of communities, but bought the voices of credible people like Al Sharpton and others to promote their message. Those messages did not exist 
in communities on their own, they were bought. And so when we think about communities of disadvantage controlling aspects of their lives, when it comes to flavors and it would, when it comes to marketing, they do not have control over that. So if you recognize that, then you begin to think about what kinds of policies would be most impactful for groups of people who have very limited control over certain aspects of their lives because of tobacco marketing and interference with the most oppressed groups. What a great end to the panel. Thank you all for participating this morning. Uh, we have a break now. Uh, paper session four will be uh, at ten, be starting at ten forty five, and this topic will continue uh, in to the noon hour. So thank you all again for being here this morning. Uh, what a fabulous panel! Thank you.